Good morning. Welcome. Good, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here um, to worship with us in spirit and truth. Uh, glad to have Tony and Ruth Ann back from their travels. And Joy, I got a little echo up here. So, anyway, we just want to open in prayer and get right to it. There's a lot coming up. Maybe we'll have some time at the end. There's a lot coming up in October and some good opportunities for you to be involved in some of the things that are going on at Sycamore Hills and an opportunity for ministry and, and uh, fellowship. And so we'll talk about those in the days to come. There might even be a sign-up sheet out there for... Um, I can't remember which one I asked Sheree to put up. It's either for the 16th of, on the... Uh, associational meeting or it's the 30th for trunk or treat so we'll have some sign-up sheets coming in the days in the next couple of weeks for you to sign up and take part in some ministry opportunities that are going to happen in october here at uh, sycamore hills so let's pray let's pray father we thank you for gathering us uh this morning father we were your church we are your church when we stepped out of bed this morning we just didn't come to church we are your church we are your body we seek to minister according to your will in our world um, and to folks in desperate need to know who you are. Father, we are grateful to have this place to gather each and every Sunday, each and every week, even throughout the week. We, we, we don't take this building and this uh, place for granted. Uh, so we ask your blessing upon um, this group and these people and our opportunities to impact our community. Father, bless us, help us, forgive us for the times when we fail. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It is good for us to gather as the people of God and to sing praises to our King and our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's do that. Let's stand together. Let's sing praises.
Yet you left the gaze of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you calmed the sea, yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the lands. With a shout, you rose victorious, resting victory from the grave. Ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry. the word of the Lord this morning, Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated as we pray together. Father, this morning we've already sung words that declare that you are God, and that Jesus is Lord of everything. We declare this morning that you are God, and that you are God alone. And Father, while you have revealed much to us, things that are necessary for faith and for life, we declare this morning still that the secret things belong to you. And Father, we confess that at times this is not a comfort to us, but a frustration. We want to know. So Father, this morning we ask for the humility to trust you. We ask for the faith to see that indeed you are immortal, invisible God only wise. You are the all-wise God. You are the all-knowing one. You are all-good, omnibenevolent. There is no unrighteousness in you. So, Father, we ask us that you would, like the psalmist, wean our souls, that they would be settled within us, that you would wean us from the way of thinking that says we have a right to know every secret counsel that belongs to you and to you alone. And Father, indeed, it is a frustration and a exasperation to our souls to try to press into those things that we do not know. Father, would you help us today instead to trust your word that says that you are working all things for good to those who love you those who are the called according to your purpose. Father, help us to see that certainty by looking to the cross of Christ and by looking to the empty 
tomb, for indeed there we see the truth that you are working all things for good. Everything that comes to pass for us is you working things together for our ultimate salvation in Jesus Christ. So, Father, this morning, we put our hope in you. We trust in you, and we trust in you alone as we walk this path set before us as your people. Father, longing for the day when questions won't matter anymore, longing for the day when faith is turned to sight, longing for the day when hope is full and realized and love remains forever. Father, help us to endure with patience and with joy and with faith, for you are our good and righteous Father. And we pray this prayer today in the name of our Lord, your dear, beloved, only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you for this time we have together to sing praise to you, but Lord, we pray that our hearts are open to you and we live our lives following your will through your word. We pray these tithes and offerings are going to show thanks to you, but again, we live our lives showing thanks to you from your word. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 261, as we ask for the wonderful words of life this morning, what a joy that we get to gather as God's people to hear his word, not just read, which is so important, but opened up to us in its proclamation. Let's sing together hymn number 261. Wonderful words, wonderful words. 
wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus only Savior, send Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 11. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I'll be, I always try to be pretty transparent. Reading this text this week caused me a lot of pain because it brings back a lot of stuff that has happened along the way in the ministry. Um, you know, it just is what it is. Uh, but it's the fight for unity. It's the fight for unity in the body of Christ that does not come naturally. We are not naturally gathered together with a bunch of diverse people with divergent opinions trying to get the same job done in kind of the same way. There are issues, concerns, troubles, etc., 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 as... Um, those issues, troubles and concerns and whatnot serve to show us that we have work to do to stay on the same page for the advancement of the gospel and the work is always toward unity. It is much simpler to go our own way and do our own thing and be our own people and have our own beliefs than it is to set that aside. I've often said that we love diversity. We have to have diversity in the church. I don't have all the gifts, you don't have all the gifts, but together we have the gifts that God has ordained that we would have to take the gospel out to the world. But it doesn't happen naturally. Now, there will be folks in the crew who grew up like you did and had parents like you did and did the same things you did, and it's kind of natural to gather amongst those folks, and everybody's going to do their thing. But, man, we are a diverse, divergent group, and we need to be more so. We need to have more diversity. Um, so, one of the ways it has played out in my life is, of course, in the, on the ball field of coaching, and... <laughs> It was different with coaching boys than it was coaching girls. Hey, it is okay for men and women to be different, and it is okay for us to celebrate our differences. That is the way God created us, and we are not all the same, and we were not created the same. But with boys, you could just challenge them. I could get in their face, 14-year-old kids, and, you know, kind of, challenge them, upbraid them for their silliness, and they would knuckle down and, and bow their neck and go get it done. Can't do that with girls. Can't do that with 18-year-old girls specifically. So what I would see when they would start to become fractured, and you know, you always had a little group here and a little group here and a little group over here. 
Well, I would then unload what I would call diarrhea of the mouth with softball. It would just be nonstop coaching, just ad nauseum until they just had to shut up because I was going to overtalk them on everything that they had to do because we had a common goal. There was a, a game to be played. There was victories to be won. There were trophies to be received. There was, we, we were not in this just for fun and games. We wanted to win. Well, that's the way it's got to be with the church. We're in it to win it for Jesus, aren't we? I mean, now, listen, he's in control, and he will do what he does when he does it. And, but it would appear from the pages of Scripture that he really likes to use clean instruments to do his work with, that you and I need to walk in his light, we need to walk in his love, we need to uh, have fellowship with one another. And so uh, I think our purpose this morning is to understand how this happens and how the troubles come and how we need to engage one another uh, so that we have unity. Now, we're not talking about unity at all costs because you and I know unity at all costs is not actually unity anyway. It's just one group gave up with their desires. It's like peace at all costs. Peace at all costs is not actually peace because you've probably compromised down that road. But it is work for the church to stay unified. So I would invite you, there's only 18 verses this morning, I think we can stand as we read those. And let me read Acts 11, 1 through 18 for you, and then we'll look at two lessons that we can take to heart to maintain our unity in the body of Christ. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance I saw a vision, a certain object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze upon it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, and everything was drawn back up into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared before the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And these six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon who is called Peter, brought here, and he shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God therefore gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Father, bless the reading of your word and to our hearing and then our obedience. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So two lessons as I read this this week. First lesson is there will always be people who take issue with the proclamation of the gospel and the propagation of the gospel to different and divergent groups. So here's Peter. We don't know the exact time frame of how long it took Peter to come back from Caesarea 
to Jerusalem. Some traditions say it took him a while, others say it didn't, whatever. He shows back up in Jerusalem and there's a crew waiting on him because they have heard what he did in Caesarea, that he went into the house of a Gentile and he preached the gospel to them. They don't say anything about the people getting saved. You notice that, this crew that's waiting on Peter? They're just mad at Peter because he sat down and ate with them. Now, Acts chapter 10, it never says he ate with them, but it does say he stayed there a few days, so you can be relatively certain that he had dinner with them, that he ate with them. That's what people do (laughs) over the course of two or three days. They had fellowship around the table. They took issue. They were circumcised. They took issue with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, in my world, when that happens to me like that, there was no question posed right there, was there? They just made a statement. A statement requires no response on my part. You can just believe what you want if that's what you want to believe, but Peter, and we should probably be ready to give an orderly sequence of events to exactly what has happened, which is exactly what Peter does. How does that sound in today's church? Because you and I know that we should probably at least remain silent if we take the gospel to another group. There is no unreached, unengaged people group in the world of which I don't know, you'll hear estimates from 3,500 to 8,000 different people groups around the world without the gospel. And there should not be one quibble amongst this group that if we were to take the gospel to one of those unreached, unengaged people groups, it should be a joyful and joyous occasion of glorifying God that we had a privilege to take the gospel to people who had no access to the gospel and that they got saved, and we would eat whatever was set before us. Been on mission trips before. Prayed the missionary prayer. You know what the missionary prayer is. I'll swallow it down, Lord, if you'll keep it down. (laughs) Standing in the 110 degree heat on the equator in Brazil, and a lady brought out these cups of glasses of ice cold water Well, you and I know that we probably shouldn't drink water out of Brazil unless it's been filtered and in a bottle somewhere. And then she brought out a bunch of boiled eggs. She had scurried around the yard and grabbed a bunch of those eggs up from the chickens that were roosting. And uh, as we, I looked at the missionary about eating it and he said, it's just a boiled egg, Flip. You can eat a boiled egg. I said, what about that water? He said, it's filtered about 200 feet deep, coming through the sandstone. He said, it'll be great. Best water I ever had. So there, but there are issues. There are issues around the world. People are going to be concerned. We should be able to go anywhere to any group at any time and share the gospel with them. There is no group that is prohibited from hearing the gospel. But it wasn't that way in Peter's day. So let's give these guys who jump Peter, my, my phrase, they jumped him when he got back. They took issue with him. There's something there. Luke's, Luke's wanting to know there's some conflict going on right there. That's why he uses those phrases that way. They took issue with him. Um, he had done something that was against the law. He'd gone into the home of a Gentile. He had had dinner with a Gentile. I mean, it was one thing for Jesus to have eat with tax gatherers and sinners, at least those people that he was eating with were actually Jewish, as far as we know. Matthew chapter 10 or 9, Mark chapter 2. He's eating with sinners and tax collectors, but they weren't Gentiles. He's eating with Gentiles. He's done something that God had prohibited them from doing. There will be some questions about that. Um... God's asked people from time to time to do things that were prohibited from doing. I mean, you know, when he tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, that, that wasn't a good thing in a worldly sense. That was against what they were supposed to do, and yet 
I love the fact that at the end of that story, what does God say? I see that you did not withhold your son, comma, your only son from me. And so here's Peter. Here's what it sounds like in 21st century America. Well, Peter, I don't know why you thought you had to go up there to Joppa and Caesarea. There were 3,000 people got saved when you preached that first sermon. You got plenty of work to do right here in our own backyard, right here in Jerusalem. I don't know why you think you have to go up there. You should be content to tend your own sheep right here than to tend somebody else's sheep over there. Peter, you went up there on church money. You didn't take your vacation time to go up there to do that. You didn't do it. Everybody else had to take their vacation time when they went up there with you. Those five, six guys that were with you, they all took vacation from their job. Why do you think you have to go over there when there are people right around the church that need to know about Jesus. I mean, I saw in the news where there was a shooting at 15200 East 40th Street. Isn't that like right there? I mean, we're in it. You don't have to go overseas. There's plenty of work to do right here. Why do you think you have to go overseas and take folks overseas? There's always going to be some folks who will complain about how big of a bite that the church or the team wants to take out of the Great Commission. Sweet little lady one day looked at me and said, Do you have any idea how small our little church is? Yeah, it's pretty obvious how small your little church is. You got any idea how big God is? You ever seen what God does with folks in the Bible who don't have much game? They don't look like they got much opportunity. They don't have a whole lot of talent. You ever seen what God does with people like Gideon? Who was a coward hanging out, threshing out wheat in the wine press? He's called a hero. It's all about what God does. There'll always be people who take issues. You'll think, well, that's, that's un, un... I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that what you've said here, Scott, would ever actually be true. And I can tell you, factually, it's absolutely the truth. Heard it with my own ears. Been there, done that, got the t-shirts for it. So we need to be ready to give that orderly defense. We need to be ready to tell people exactly what has happened. And that's exactly what Peter does. In our world today, there's not one people group on planet Earth that Christians should ever take issue with reaching uh, with the gospel for the Lord Jesus. Uh, This is not a problem that should ever beset a Christian missionary or evangelist living in the age of grace, post-Calvary, and post the first Easter. First of all, we ought to look at ourselves, and we ought to examine ourselves. And for you 80s movie buffs, in the immortal words of John Winger, now you have to go Google that later, we, in the immortal words of John Winger, from the movie Stripes, that our forefathers were kicked out of every decent country in the world. We are the wretched refuge. We are the underdog. We are the mutts. And so I don't know why we would think so highly of ourselves that there's some group out there that doesn't deserve our shoe leather, our elbow grease, our blood, sweat, and tears, our our efforts to reach them with the gospel. You and I are strangers and aliens on planet Earth, and guess what? So is everybody else. Everybody else is a stranger and alien on planet Earth. This is not the final resting place for any of us. We are going to meet Jesus one day face to face, and you better to have his blood covering your sin, or hell will be the only option for you. And there are places around the world that are dangerous to take the gospel. I understand that. 
All of your days are written in the book. There's not a one of them that's written that God didn't know before they were any. any. You're not checking out of planet Earth one day early. And so we've got to be ready to take the gospel. We've got to be slow to take issue with the gospel being taken out to people. Whatever the strife. Do you realize there's not a group out here that shouldn't have the gospel presented to them? How about Black Lives Matter? Do they need the gospel? Absolutely. How about LGBTQ? Do they need the gospel? Absolutely. Had a friend of mine one time, they were going to write an ordinance in Tulsa about uh, discrimination against homosexuals. He was against writing those ordinances. He was a good Christian fellow. He was against writing those ordinances. He he felt like we had enough laws against discrimination on the books that we didn't need to add any more. We can debate that back and forth politically, however you want to feel about that. My response to him is he was going to go down and protest. I mean, he was going to carry a placard, and he was going to march up and down the street on the opposite side of the street of the gay community who was pushing for that ordinance. And I was like, dude, you just need to go down there and take the gospel to those people. People are going to die and go to hell without the gospel. And you're going to go down there and protest. Why don't you go take the gospel to people? Wouldn't that be a better use of your time to take the gospel? Share the gospel with people who got issues? Aren't you glad somebody shared the gospel with you when you had issues? (laughs) Aren't you glad you're still hearing the gospel Sunday after Sunday and you still got issues? (laughs) We're all a work in progress. There are over 30 languages spoken in the Kansas City metro area. None of those people are off limits for a gospel presentation. You may have to find some translators, but none of those people are off limits. None of them. No identity group is off limits. No people group are off limits. No religious groups are off limits. See, we don't proselytize. As Christians, we don't proselytize. We're gospel people to see people actually get saved. Proselytizing is we're going to pull somebody from one group to another group, and we're just doing that to build up our empire. I want to see the kingdom of God advanced, and that's what you and I need to hope for. Um, There's no identity group. There's no religious group. You can take the gospel to the Buddhists. You can take the gospel to the Hindus, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Catholics. And you know what? If you beat the bushes long enough, you might knock out a couple of backslidden Baptists that need to hear the gospel as well. When 80% of us are nowhere to be found in this moment across the United States of America. Now, is that sad or what? 80% of us, Southern Baptists, are not found in fellowship with brothers and sisters before the Lord in this moment right now across the United States of America. They took issue. They took issue. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeding, which is inserted, uh, to explain to them in orderly sequence exactly what happens. And then he relays exactly what happened. And it's interesting. Did you notice he's added a couple of things that weren't in the original third-person account of Luke recording the sheet coming down? And that Peter says, this sheet, this object came down like a sheet, lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. On 10, it says it came down to the ground. He said, that came down to me. And then he adds wild beasts. He adds a category of wild beasts in there. Doesn't mean it wasn't there in the first one. It's just Luke didn't record that. But he's seeing everything. You know, if you invite me, he's seeing all of those animals that were forbidden to be eaten. And you know, some of those animals you and I don't want to eat. If you invite me over for the Chiefs game and you're going to bring out some pelican drumsticks to eat, I'm probably not going to run to grab me one of them, or some hoot owl wings, barn owl, you know. There's some stuff we don't eat. I had an opportunity to eat some roadkill in Brazil on one of those trips, a big anaconda, and you know, things die like that. I'll eat about anything, but 
I'm going to step back from that. I told the boys, I said, I'll eat about anything. I ate fish head stew. I ate feijoada, which is a national dish of Brazil. It's got snoots and ears and tails and feet in it. Now I'm making y'all hungry. We'll be, we'll be done here in a minute so you can get to Cracker Barrel. Um, but I draw the line at roadkill. So P there's Peter. He's seeing all that stuff. I mean, think about it. If you're in a trance, if God gives you a vision and you're looking up there and there's some good old barn owls and a hawk and, you know, a pelican and some of them crawly things, and he tells you to get up and eat, Lord, I'm fasting today. <laughs> I've washed my face and I'm fasting. I'm going out before the world and I'm fasting from all of that today, Lord. It's not going to happen. No, you get up and kill and eat. And it's all for one purpose so that he can see that the Gentiles are coming. And then he goes and he enters and he sees the Holy Spirit fall on them. And they began speaking in tongues as they did in... Uh, when he fell at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on them at Pentecost. And there's a reason, because Peter's got to see that this thing is meant for humanity. It's not just segmented to the Jewish nation. This thing is open to everyone, and the Gentiles are coming in. And Peter's got to know that the Gentiles are welcome, and he does exactly the same thing. And Peter's a thinking guy. He's putting two and two together, and he says, whoa, exactly what happened at Pentecost to us is now happening to these people right here. If God has opened the doors for the Gentiles to come in, who am I to stand in his way and keep those people out? That's the first lesson be prepared, be ready, it happens. Sometimes it happens friendly, sometimes it happens not so friendly. Sometimes it happens. You need to be ready to recall exactly what God did in those moments as you reached out with the gospel and people re responded. I would hope in the 21st century, having lived some 2,000 years beyond these events, that you and I would not have one begrudging comment about any person who received the gospel and accepted it and was baptized and churches were planted. Uh, if you do, you might want to check your salvation card at the door to make sure you really are who you think you are. What's the second lesson? The second lesson is he gives them that orderly sequence of events and they receive it. Now, we live in a far different world than what Peter lived in, although as humanly speaking, we're all still humans. We all still got many of the same problems. But in the social media world in which we live today, they're right and we're wrong. And it just doesn't really matter what your argument is. Logic no longer plays any role as we deal with people. That's why in the 21st century, my answer as Peter would have been, yep, that's exactly what happened. Because most people aren't interested in an explanation. Most people aren't interested in hearing the details. Most people just want to be right, and you're going to be wrong, and that's just the way the world works. We need to be, as these fellows were who take issue with Peter, they were quick to listen. They were slow to speak. They followed what James, in James 1.19, admonishes us to be. But in today's world, it doesn't work that way so much. Now, you should still have an orderly defense. You should still give an orderly sequence. You should be prepared to not win any friends and enemies over to your side because the world has largely made up its mind. Now, God will intervene, and we pray that he will. And it depends upon where this discussion takes place. 
If it takes place in the hallways, then we've got an opportunity for that to happen well. If it takes place out in the world somewhere, they, they're, they're not listening. An orderly sequence of events is what Peter gives them. Imagine that, telling the story exactly the way it happened. Logically, people are not so much interested in logic anymore. I had a lady one time challenge me on my beliefs on being pro-life. So I immediately go to Psalm 139 and I begin to talk about fearfully and wonderfully made and all of that good stuff. Talk about the fact that when you know, Jesus was born or conceived to an unwed mother and you go down through all of those and at the end her, her response to me was, well how would you feel if the uh, government started harvesting organs from dead people? And she was trying to link those two things together. And logic had no part in that. And I said, so you're trying to use something that doesn't happen, that's fictitious, and you're trying to give it as a reason for the reason pro-choice stuff ought to happen over here. See, and even today, I can see the look on your face, and that's exactly the look I had. Like, what? They don't know logic. They can't put sequences together. They can't link things together. And it's pointless to try to have that discussion. We've got to be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. We've got to know when to shake the dust off our feet and move on and when it is to plant ourselves and dig in for the long haul. Now, we've dug in for the long haul at 15200 East 39th Street, so we're going to be here until Jesus comes back. Our, that's our goal, right? But there are some times where... I wish we weren't bound by brick and mortar. I've always had that deep inside me. I wish we weren't bound by the brick and mortar. It's a great place to meet. It's a great place to gather. And we, we enjoy fellowship with one another here. It's a great place. That second lesson is let's make sure that we have an orderly defense, but let's also be quick to hear the orderly defense when we're on the other side of the equation. Let's listen to it, let's process it, let's think about it logically, let's see what God is doing, and I realize God will defy our logic sometimes, I understand that, but he works through that as well many times. What I enjoyed about reading this and what I picked up as I read this this week is this is actually a two-way street of communication. And if communication is going to happen, there has to be a two-way street. My theology professor used to say that communication happens when you can repeat back to me in your own words what I said in such a way that I know that you know what I said. Now that's a mouthful. These guys got it. They understood what Peter was saying and they believed it. So many times in our world, there's always an agenda. Somebody's got an agenda. Somebody's got a, a, a motive, an ulterior motive. There's some kind of conspiracy theory that's going on. These guys communicated. They actually talked where you uh, can repeat back, as I said, what I said to you in such a way in your own words, not just parrot. You're not going to parrot what someone said. You're going to say it in your words so that the person who said it the first time knows that you know what he said. That's what communication, that's what happens here. That's why this thing ends well. You notice that? And when they heard this, verse 18, they quieted down. So you can imagine there was some hubbub going on in that little meeting. You got Peter and six of his buddies standing there. They've seen what happened and they're going to come to Peter's defense. And then you got this other group that's come to meet them that took issue with the fact that he ate with Gentiles. It wasn't so much he shared the gospel with them. They were mad that he ate with them. He might have eaten something unclean. Oh, my. I, as I read that even this morning, and Peter says, 
Lord, I've never, never eaten anything unclean. No, but you cussed Jesus when they caught you at the fire that night. Do we see the difference in that? Remember when the girl says that? Hey, curse Jesus. Jesus looks at him in chapter in Luke. Peter didn't eat anything unclean. But his heart wasn't right at the time. And then he understands all that Jesus has been saying. I get it. That's what he meant when he says, you know, John, John the Baptist baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's seeing that what Jesus said that was specifically pointed toward them is now about the whole world. It's all come. What Peter had was a revolutionary ministry. And that's where I want to close today. It was a revolutionary ministry. It had never been done before. <laughs> We've never done it like that here before, preacher. That won't work around here, preacher. <laughs> Peter had a revolutionary ministry. He took the gospel to people who were outside of who the gospel was supposed to go to, and he gave it to them, and God moved, and the Holy Spirit fell, and they all got saved and got baptized. And now we're surrendered to the Lord It was revolutionary. So the question that I want to ask today is, how revolutionary is the ministry at Sycamore Hills Baptist Church? How revolutionary is it? The answer is not much. Not much. It's not an indictment. It's just the way it is. Can we be revolutionary? We're going to have to be revolutionary as you move forward. New pastor, I hope he's revolutionary. I'm going to be right there with him. I hope it's revolutionary. What are we doing? What are we doing with our building? What are we doing with our folks? One of the challenges I used to have for Norfleet, we had a bunch of senior adults at Norfleet. We had a bunch of senior adults at Norfleet. Well, I'm looking around the room. Guess what? A bunch of senior adults here. They used to have a game day. And do you know it is okay for Baptists to play games with cards? Did you know that? I blew their minds the, first, the very first Thursday of game day when I was their pastor and I walked in and they had these like eight decks of cards. They played this game called Hand and Foot over at Norfleet. I got to get them to come over here and teach y'all how to play Hand and Foot. It's a really fun game. It was like eight decks of cards and I walked back in there to get a cup of coffee and they had those cards all over the table and I said, what in the world is going on in here? Oh, Brother Porter said it was okay for us to play with cards. They thought I was some old hard shell Baptist. Can't play a game with a card or a dice. Can't do any of that. I used to beg them. Can't do it for them. Used to beg them. Why don't we reach senior adults in this community? Are there any other senior adults outside the door of the church? Do you think there's any senior adults in these neighborhood? Absolutely. Chronologically speaking, who's closer to meeting Jesus, them or the young families? <laughs> Chronologically speaking, they're at higher risk to meet Jesus before the younger families are going to, and they're going to hell without Jesus. Why don't, we, why don't we get some senior adult stuff going? Why don't, we have, why don't we have a game day? What are we using that gym for back there? Just lease it to polish off the rubber marks from the preschoolers riding trikes on it? We got to use that gym for something. That gym, this is revolution, revolutionary ministry. Imagine that. You got a gym. We need, a, we need a community, we need a kids, we need upward basketball over here. I got to take my grandson to up, I got to take him to the Lutherans to get into church basketball. Let me use that gym back here. Cost you about $12,000, already checked, about $12,000 to buy four portable basketball goals and make two goals, two courts, half courts and play. You got restrooms back there. Movie nights. That's a great theater. I don't know if you guys ever had movie nights back there. That's a great theater. Have free movie nights. We used to actually have people come in off the street at Norfleet to see a free movie. Actually came in off the street. Couldn't get them to come back. I'm not telling you any of this stuff is going to blow this room up where we got to have 14 services on Sunday to get all the people. But what else do you want to do? 
We've got to take the gospel to people. So our plan at uh, Trunk or Treat coming up October 30th, 3.30 in the afternoon, we're going we're gonna to figure out, Tony and I are going to figure out how to organize that parking lot so we get those people in a path, in a, in a path around the cars in order, and we're going to tell the story of Jesus from car to car to car to car as they get candy. Some people will say, well, will they, will they stand to hear the story? And it's like, well, eight years in a row at Norfleet, they did. So unless independence people are just not as civil as Raytown people, I don't know. I think they are. So they'll listen to those stories. It would be a little bit revolutionary. And guess what? I don't intend to be one of the guys at one of the cars telling the stories. Because I get to do that every Sunday anyway. That's it. your job to tell these children about Jesus and a vignette of the story of Jesus ending. We'll go from birth through his life, miracles. We'll figure out the stories. We got about eight to 12 stories we need to tell and we can have 20 or 30 cars out there giving away candy. Let's do something revolutionary. Let's just get outside the box. Let's not do what we, you know, we just keep doing the same old things the same old ways and expect the new results. We're just nuts. It won't work. I've been on the receiving end of the taking issue on mission trips. And I will take those scars with me until I meet Jesus. They were my scars to bear. It was unbelievable that Baptist, the biggest mission sending group in the world, that anyone in a pew would take issue with taking the gospel to an unreached group. But they do. Give them an orderly sequence. Pray that God will direct their heart to receive it. No hidden agendas, no ulterior motives, no conspiracy theories, no money under the table, uh, perfect and clean accounting of every penny that was ever donated and spent on everything it was spent on. But people will take issue when they do. Give them an orderly defense. Pray that God would allow them to see it and hear it and maintain the unity because nothing will destroy the church quicker than that kind of disunity in the body. Have you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you come to that place where... You're willing to do whatever he called you to do to go wherever he called you to go to answer whatever questions that he calls you to answer in whatever group that he calls you to answer them in. Are you ready to be like Peter to go to these other places? Are you ready to get on a plane and go somewhere and engage a a people that have no access to the gospel? You know, there are places around the world where they do not have this book in their language. They have no option unless you or me as a missionary go. Are you prepared to do that? Will you do that? It all starts with receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. None of this is possible without His Spirit being poured out in us to be able to do what He's called us to do. We will fail miserably. Sometimes when we fail... It looks like judgment has fallen on the land. He's judging those people. He's not bringing them to himself because they deserve judgment, as did you and I. But we continue to offer the gospel because in that one moment, just like it happened in your life and my life, if you've received Jesus, you come to him in faith and receive him. All of a sudden, the lights come on and you realize it's the truth. Have you done that? Christians... Man, let's maintain the unity. Let's, let's do that. Let's, it's work. It's going to be work. It'll always be work. It'll never be anything less than work. It's going to take elbow grease. It's going to take shoe leather. It's going to take forgiveness. It's going to take questions and answers. It's just going to take that. It's just what it does. And it's worth working on. It's worth having. Because without it, we have no hope of advancing the gospel. As a church... We say this all the time, I hate cliches, 
I worked for a boss one time that just spoke in cliches. Cliches generally have really no meaning. But we, it's time to be revolutionary. It's time to get outside of the box. It's time. It's time. People are dying and going to hell. Jesus is going to return. We don't know when. We're one day closer now than we were this time yesterday. He's coming. Are there people out there that you know that need him? Guaranteed there are. As a church, let's pull the chalks off the wheels. <laughs> let's stick the thing in high gear and let's go for what we got for as long as we can, and just see what God will do with that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. Father, we thank you that it is work to stay unified in the church. It's work. It's work. We're not naturally accustomed to it. To be honest, Lord, it's simpler to just sit in your house and be left alone. But that's not what you've called us to do, and that's not who you called us to be. And so, Lord, um, help us to look, to really look at people, to look at those people groups, to look at those language groups, to look at those identity groups, and to figure out ways in which to engage them with the gospel. And Father, when questions come, we'll give orderly answers and an orderly sequence of exactly what you did and exactly how you do it. And we will expect that that will be received and received well because we are in the game of unity. Father, it was your son who said the world will know that you sent him when we are one. Help us to be one. Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is, take my life and let it be. Now, don't, don't end there, right? That's the old game that music ministers play. Because that's what we really want. Take my life, Lord, and let it be. No, let it be consecrated only unto thee. That's what we want our lives to be. So I would pray that that would be your prayer to the Lord as you stand and sing. If you're looking for a church home, we'd invite you to come and plant your ministry here. We're about to kick this thing into high gear one of these days, okay? You, wanna, you want your seat, but we'll, we're installing. Tony and I, we've got a call in. We're going to have seat belts put on the chairs so that if it gets a little bumpy, you'll still stay in your seat, okay? So let's, let's sing. October is going to be a really busy month here at Sycamore Hills. Um, on the 16th, 
in the evening, we've got the Blue River Kansas City Associational semi-annual meeting. And they're gonna bring their trailer, but they're gonna, the trailer that we had for Vacation Bible School. I told them we are not doing cotton candy. Okay, Darby, no cotton candy. She wore the cotton candy home at Vacation Bible School. Uh, but we, we can do snow cones, we can do popcorn, and they want the bounce house out here. So we will need some folks who can come and help that at five o'clock that evening. At six o'clock, we're gonna have a meal. Now they've asked me to smoke some meat. So you wanna come for that. You really do. Uh, they are gonna bring, it's gonna be a carry-in dinner. So we don't have to prepare food, but we do need some kitchen folks. And you don't have to be on the kitchen committee to be a part of this. If you, <laughs> you can come help to receive the food and get it set up and they're gonna eat at six and then we'll be in here at seven for a little worship time and then the business session. Tony's gonna lead our music, our singing that evening. I'll get to pray and then get out of the way. So uh, that's coming up on the 16th and then two weeks after that, we'll have trunk or treat. You don't have to tell Bible stories. If you just wanna hand out candy, you can do that. But we're gonna need eight to 12 folks who are willing to tell Bible stories about Jesus as those little darlings come through in their little costumes to get their candy. We also need registration that evening. We're gonna register people that come in here to do this so that we have some idea of who they are and where they're from if they'll tell us the truth. They won't always tell you the truth, that's okay. Most of them will, and then we can follow up with them with phone calls, letters, cards, door knocking, whatever, and invite them to come. So be in prayer for what your involvement will be. October's gonna be busy, okay? You're gonna have somebody preaching on the 9th for me. I'll be out that that Sunday, and so, um, anyway, lots going on. Tony, let's finish. Remember church council meeting tonight at 445, so I hope to see you there. Uh, if you know a friend that was camping and is coming back today that's supposed to be part of that meeting, give them a call just to remind them. Would you do that for me? I'm done. No. It's all right. Hear this word of benediction as we go today. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You are dismissed.